Yep, so it looks like the uh, most people have managed to, to arrive. Um, so I'd like to, uh, to, to begin by the acknowledgement of country. So we would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which our four Australian campuses stand and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And uh, today we are very um, happy to welcome Professor Frank Wolak uh, to present uh, to us all. Uh, Frank is a professor in the Department of Economics at Stanford University, and we're very happy also to have him on a fractional appointment at Monash, linked to the Australian Electricity Market Initiative, uh, run out of the business school. So um, Frank has been and remains a world leading competition and regulatory economist, particularly with respect to the electricity sector, but uh, not limited there. Um, so I personally know Frank uh, well enough to basically stop with the listing of all his accolades because you'll either blush or get angry with me, but I'll just say that he's studied or advised in, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in many markets or, or advised many regulators around the world. It might actually be quicker to say the ones he hasn't or is less familiar with. I'm not sure if you've ever studied the Greenland market or something like that, Frank, um, but uh, and I'll just uh, and by saying he's dealt with, I'm sure, many hairy issues in his work over the years, but I'm sure his greatest accomplishment was finding a way to supervise yours truly, uh, his PhD to completion. Not sure how you achieved that, but I'm very grateful. So Frank, we are thrilled to have you here um, and, and, and to talk about something that is a topical issue in Australia, like the rest of the world, particularly here, which is the impact of uh, distributed renewable investment uh, on the uh, distribution network. So please, uh, if you could share your screen, Frank, and take it away. Okay. Can you see my screen, Gordon? Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Gordon, uh, for the introduction. And it was a pleasure having Gordon as a student. Uh, and it's a pleasure still interacting with Gordon. So, uh, and thanks very much for the invitation. So, um, so the, uh, what I, what, uh, Oh, no. Okay, so um, th th this is just a, one example of the, I guess, the general motivation for the problem is this idea that if you invest in distributed generation, uh, this can uh, effectively, uh, as least as the quote in the New York Times, is you know take the pressure off the distribution network, reduce the need for future distribution network investments would be uh, a simple uh, uh, claim that's often made that uh, of what uh, distributed generation will do. Uh, and as you can see, if you take a look at this, this is just a, taken from uh, US uh, Department of Energy data. The interesting thing to note is that th this is in some sense, uh, it seems kind of contrary to what we're experiencing with respect to capital investment. In, in particular, you can see that O&M costs and uh, just uh, the, the, the standard, uh, uh, dist, uh, you know, with customer expenses, but capital investment, it keeps, uh, keeps going up. So um, the question is, 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 you know, to what extent uh, is this kind of claim that's commonly uh, talked about, uh, in fact, the case? And just to give an example, you can sort of, the, you get these very divergent views. This is taken from uh, a, a filing that was made in the state of Utah, but, you know, very different implications for, you know, what is the uh, a reduction in cost associated with, say, an investment in distributed solar. You have the solar uh, provider uh, with giving you this number. You have the incumbent utility uh, giving you this number. So um, what we're going to do in this paper is actually look at based on actual power flows. And so the nice thing that we have access to is a, a very detailed data set for all uh, distribution network uh, uh, access points that effectively gives us hourly flows. And we also have a time series of uh, the investments in distributed generation um, in those distribution networks. And so what we're gonna do is, is use that uh, to effectively look at the relationship between um, the uh, investments in distributed generation 
and the need for upgrades to the distribution grid. And so the, the basic, just for folks who aren't um, electricity uh, geeks, the basic idea is the traditional approach to electricity is you essentially produce it at a large scale uh, generation statement. And in the, in, the, in the case of France, these typically are uh, nuclear power stations uh, with massive turbines. And you move the power from the large scale generation facility down to uh, customers along a high voltage transmission network. You uh, uh, transform the voltage down to a lower voltage that you then move it through the distribution network. And then you even have a transformer at the household level that actually uh, reduces the voltage even further so that you can consume it uh, at, at, with the standard household appliance. So that's the kind of uh, typical way things went with the advent of distributed solar. Uh, one example, or just distributed generation in, in general, what can happen is, is that you can put these devices in the distribution network and you can actually have uh, both power flows going out of the distribution network as well as into the distribution network. Uh, and so as well as also flowing from say this location where the distributed generation technology is located to say this location and uh, this location. Uh, but but so, so that's the basic um, data that we're gonna use is essentially information right at this, this interface. And, what you can see is this is just one example of is well known to anyone certainly uh, about the intermittency that you can get uh, with respect to uh, solar as well as this is for wind. This is just the extent to which the, this uh, wind unit, uh, it's intermittency over uh, a two week interval. So what we're gonna, what we have is we've collected data on, as I said, um, five types of distributed generation technologies, uh, solar PV, wind, small hydro, uh, and then renewable and non-renewable thermal. So think of renewable thermal would be something like, you know, biomass and non-renewable thermal, well, that would be, you know, a natural gas or uh, a, a most likely a, a oil-fired power plant, diesel, you know, diesel powered fire power plant. So the, what we, we look at, at the case of France, largely because of the uh, ability and, and access that we have uh, to, to data at an hourly level uh, at, at each of these uh, distribution interconnections. And um, one of the things for sure is true is that, you know, what, what is the case is a megawatt hour investment in uh, distributed uh, uh, generation certainly reduces the average net load that you know supplied to the distribution grid, meaning that the the amount that's getting pulled off the distribution grid on average over all hours of the year certainly goes down simply because it you know sort of has to if the that unit produces anything. But the surprising result to us is that it it for both wind and PV, we find from our analysis that essentially a, there is virtually zero uh, impact at the upper uh, end of the uh, uh, load duration, net load duration distribution. So think of it as at the upper end of the distribution of poles from the distribution uh, to the distribution grid, the additional megawatt uh, of distributed solar or distributed wind uh, has virtually no effect on the peak withdrawals uh, from uh, the distribution grid. Whereas in contrast, as you would expect, is that uh, you know, for the thermal and small hydro uh, resources, uh, we, we do find at the upper end of that distribution, uh, an investment in distributed generation does uh, seem to uh, reduce the uh, net demand. So how do we, how do we uh, come up with these results? Well, what we do is we said is that all these uh, substations right there where the, where the question mark is, we've got essentially uh, the uh, power flows on an hourly basis. And this is just to show you that, you know, so think of it as the first picture, picture A is France. The next picture is then this box here is then here. Then the next picture you can see is this box here. 
And what you can see is if you look, you can see the uh, dot that gives basically the distribution substation. And then you can see what's connected off of it. You can see it's connected to houses with rooftop solar systems with a larger scale uh, solar system connected there. And that's the information that we essentially use over time to construct a time series of how much distributed uh, generation capacity there is behind each of the more than uh, 2000 substations that we have data for. Um, and what we have is this net load level, meaning how much is essentially being pulled at this location right here uh, in the distribution grid, which is in the case of France, it's that you know the the the, the distribution grid uh, is basically stepping down uh, to effectively 20 kb or uh, uh, or below. So um, all right, and these are as we said, the data that we have runs from 2005 uh, to 2018. So what we this this is just giving you an example of the raw data that we have. And then what we do is we're gonna come up with what we call for each of these substations, okay? So for each of the blue dots here, we're gonna come up with a annual load duration curve, which is essentially just think of it as the cumulative distribution function of this, the hourly load levels for the 8,760 hours of the year. And we're gonna also look at hourly ramps, which is basically, by hourly ramps, we mean the change in output level from period T to period T uh, plus one, okay? And that's our hourly ramp rates because an, another thing that we're, we're going to see is, if you like, this idea of what do these investments do to, if you like, sort of the, the stress on the system in the sense of how much can this load change across hours? and what does the investment in uh, distributed solar, wind, other technologies do uh, to these hourly uh, ramp rates for this net load that's coming out of each uh, distribution network. So to get the load duration curve, think of it as we just take the, um, the, the hourly values and you just stack them from the lowest to the highest. And so you can, you know, as you go up, you can see that you, 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 know, you, you essentially just sort them according to the hours of the year. And you will get, if you like, a, uh, a essentially this uh, cumulative distribution function. And so, um, you know, just to go further, you can see that, okay, uh, with probability one right out here, this is, or it, right here, P hat, that's basically telling us that you, with probability, um, you know, no uh, one minus p hat, your capacity that uh, of net pull from the distribution grid will be less than or equal to k star. And so, what we, as we said, what we do is this for each of the load duration curves, we're going to compute what this um, this distribution looks like. And what we're interested in is what happens to this uh, distrib load distribution curve as you invest in each kind of uh, uh, distributed generation technology. And so you could think of it as, okay, in this case, we do, we, we, we do an investment and the, the curve changes to the red curve. What this is basically saying is we're getting almost no capacity savings, right? Because up at a very high level, we are virtually no difference in the uh, amount of capacity necessary for, you know, at, with 101 probability one. Whereas down here, you can see we're getting more capacity savings at the low levels of the distribution of net demand. And then up here, you could think of a different one where what we're doing is getting large capacity savings because as you can see, we're, we're reducing uh, the point at which that distribution uh, uh, essentially hits one. And so that would be sort of the example of, yes, an investment in capacity is reducing our need for uh, distribution network uh, capacity. In other words, it is allowing us to forego future distribution 
network investment. So what we what we do is, as I said, for each one of these um, uh, locations for each year, we are essentially computing this blue line, this red line, a, a, as and as it changes over time. And then what we're going to do is, how do we then summarize this information? That's where we're going next. But think of it as for each location, for each 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 uh, each year, we're basically computing what this is. So we have. As you said, for the more than 2,000 locations, for the um, the essentially uh, uh, 14 years of data, we've got you know quite a bit of of of, uh, of information. So we do the same thing for the hourly ramps. It's just now we have to first take the 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 pattern of the net load. Then we take, if you like, the first difference of that. That's what we mean by the ramp rate. So what was the delta between the period, last period and this period. And that is what we're plotting right here. That's just the, if you like, this curve here is the plot of the rate of change of this curve right here. And then we do the same thing where we're going to get the hourly uh, low duration curve or the you know distribution of these hourly ramps uh, doing the same thing. We just stack them up from the largest negative to the largest positive uh, of the hourly ramp rates over the 8,076 hours of the year. Okay. And then, you know, same sort of purpose would be as we'd say, okay, we would look to see as it reduces the ramp by pushing this down, or it can increase the ramp by, by pushing it up. And so that's what we're, so again, what we're going to have is for each location, each year, we've got this curve, and then what we do is we, as this is just saying, we we the information that we've gotten on the various uh, uh, distributed generation capacities. One issue that we ran into is there are some issues where, with the with only uh, uh, the exception of some of the solar PV units we were able to assign every distributed generation unit to a specific step station. For the uh, solar units, there are some, we, we have the aggregates, but we have various methods that we have used to essentially assign, if you like, the solar PV capacity that's in this red area here and the yellow area that, 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 that basically, uh, uh, and we, we perform various sensitivity analyses to how we do that, but the results are pretty much invariant to uh, a variety of different ways that, that we do it. Uh, as, um, and just, just, so what's been happening? Well, uh, what you can see is the, 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 the two, as expected, the two big distributed generation investments that have been occurring in France are obviously wind, it's distributed wind and distributed solar PV. But there has been, you know, some both non-renewable thermal, renewable thermal, and as you can see, small hydro. All right. So as we said, what we've got is for each of the uh, substations, we have the installed capacity of technology T at substation S at the end of year Y. And then what we have is this variable, we'll call it Y, uh, capital Y, little at S. T is for substation Y in, in, in where Y is the year. And what we have is we're going to focus on quantiles of the distribution. In other words, points along that distribution curve that you've seen. So in other words, right, right, if we go back to this picture here, we're going to look at various points of the percentiles of this distribution. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use those as our dependent variable in, in a regression. And so we're gonna run a regression for each of the, if you like, quantiles of the distribution um, and get, if you like, a, uh, a, as you can see, a marginal effect on that quantile of a given investment in the distribution network capacity. So think of it as we're running a separate regression for each percentile where the variable is that percentile for that location for that year, that's Y. And then the dependent variables are going to be the installed capacity 
by technology at under, beneath that substation for that year. And so, uh, Frank, uh, uh, I'll just interrupt you for a moment. We've had a question from the audience. It's a, I, I think, a clarification question, which sure. uh, you might want to go. Um, and, and so, I think I know the answer, but I'll let you you, you go. That that they're asking, um, uh, you know regarding I guess minimizing or not capacity load I think you're, of course you're talking about the substation load uh, does Frank mean that distributed small scale solar capacity that's being fed into the substations is not diminishing electricity produced by the base load power station so I guess to restate the exercise you, you, this, this is probably the right figure to, to answer that yeah all we're, remember what this is looking at is the distribution of withdrawals from the grid uh, uh, the distribution of withdrawals from the grid at that location. So, in other words, there it's it for sure that for sure there is no doubt that the amount of energy that is coming off the transmission network uh, is going to be less over the course of the year as a result of production of energy from the distributed generation units. No doubt about that. Um, unless, of course, demand increases much more than, uh, 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 than does the amount of distributed generation capacity. But what we're talking about is, does the peak demand that is being withdrawn from the transmission network change as a result of the investments in these technologies? Does the 50th percentile of that net demand fall? Does the 25th percentile of that demand fall? Does the 10th percentile of that demand fall? That's that's what we're we're looking at. Thanks, Frank. And uh, one other question since we've stopped you. Someone's just asked, um, what's driving the investment in distributed wind capacity in France? And that this is, seems quite a different situation to say in Australia. Um, uh, you know, it, it, I suspect it is, you know, the same thing that's driving it in many other jurisdictions is just simply the fact that, I mean, uh, uh, wind is certainly cheaper and historically cheaper than um, solar, and at least on a levelized cost basis. So my guess is, is that's what was driving a, a lot of the investment in, in wind versus solar in the case of France. Um, and um, yeah, it, 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 so it, 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 that's that that would you know that that's pretty much these are uh, entities that are making these investments, and I suspect in the interest of uh, saving themselves money, they are basically investing in the thing that has the lower levelized cost uh, and and the, for the same amount of energy or even more energy produced. Okay. Thanks. Sure. So. Um, the one thing is, is the other thing that I would think is important is different is there's very little, uh, so there's not much support for distributed solar in France versus say what happened in Germany or what happened in California and other kinds of things. So these are, um, you know, the, the support schemes are more just uh, a level playing field. All right. So, um, so the change in the, as we said, what we're interested in is looking at the uh, change in the uh, in in uh, you know each of the quantiles. And so one of the way, way the way we're going to do that is just to skip through is we're going to run these following regressions. So for for the top uh, for the bottom one percent quantile, we are going to run the regression of that quantile for that substation for that year on the total capacity that's installed for uh, that technology, for that substation for that year, we're gonna include uh, substation fixed effects and year fixed effects. Why we're gonna include year fixed effects to account for the fact that we think that demand at the substation is likely changing. So we're going to you know, uh, uh, account for the fact that, that you know, if you like, demand in the country is likely increasing the, that that dummy for the year will hopefully uh, capture the just secular increase in demand from electricity uh, throughout the throughout the country. All right. So what we do is for each of these quantiles of that distribution at each of the substation, we're running that regression. 
And then from that regression, what we're getting, if you like, is the, if you like, the marginal effect or the predictive reduction, if you like, in what that quantile is, uh, if you like, the conditional mean of that quantile, given a one megawatt change in that technology is giving you uh, what is what that coefficient is giving you. And then the way that we, 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 we represent it is, is, is in terms of this picture. So what we do is we just simply plot up the coefficient. So think of this would be right here would be the coefficient at the first percentile. If this would be the coefficient at say the 10th percentile, and then this would be the coefficient at the 25th percentile, and we just connect the dots. And then you can see over here is the coefficient associated with the 99th percentile. And what you can see here is sort of exactly what we would, we would hope for uh, from distributed generation is pretty much uniform reduction for all quantiles in the amount of net withdrawals that are coming out. And even more so, the downward slope also makes sense, right? Because what you would expect that someone would do with a, say, on-site diesel facility, which is a non-renewable thermal facility, is when the demand and the, the, the uh, price is very high in the wholesale market, um, and um, it would very likely a, um, uh, turn that unit on, and turning that unit on would therefore have the largest effect in reducing the peak more than reducing the off-peak hours, simply because it may not make economic sense to run that expensive diesel unit uh, during the hours when that net demand is, 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 is lower than it is during the peak hours. So running during the peak hours, this is precisely the um, pattern that you'd expect to get from the quantile impact function. All right, so then what we do is these are the renewable uh, thermal and small hydro. And again, you, you, you can see that most likely what's, what's, what's likely going on here is, is you know, these are uh, some potentially run of river small hydro. Uh, they're producing all the time which means they're also probably reducing the peak as well, um, but they're also reducing much more, if you like, at the lower uh, distributions uh, of, the, of the quantiles. So then finally, we, we fold in the uh, values for uh, PV and for wind. And what you can see is for PV, you can see that there's a, 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 a substantial reduction in the quantiles of the very uh, low in the distribution of uh, net demand from the uh, 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 of electricity from the transmission network. So in other words, during the lowest, if you like, net demand times, the uh, the the impact of a, a megawatt of solar pushes down that quantile very much. But as you move up the quantiles of the distribution of net demand, the marginal effect on those quantiles of an investment in a megawatt of distributed solar, as you can see, has not really even a statistically different from zero effect on the peak. In fact, you know, all the way down to probably about you know, 80 uh, the 80th percentile of that distribution, or even close to the 75th, it's not statistically different from zero. And similarly, for the case of wind, you get a very small uh, reduction, at least in the peak demand um, it, with respect to wind. So, but, but still uh, by far the smallest peak reduction relative to the um, other technologies, the non-renewable thermal, uh, the uh, small hydro and the, the renewable thermal. So that, that's basically the story, which is, again, it, it, in terms of the peak utilization of the distribution network is, is effectively the fact that for these dispatchable resources or resources that produce potentially 24 seven, 
such as say a run of river hydro facility, um, you know, small run of river hydro, uh, you do get a reduction in the peak utilization of the distribution uh, 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 you know, uh, network uh, it, it, or withdrawals from the transmission network to the distribution network. But for the case of uh, PV and non-renewable thermal, uh, pretty much uh, no change in the peak withdrawals from the, 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 distribu the transmission network to the distribution network. Okay, so what about the case of ramps? So we can go through and do the same thing. And here, again, you can see that for the most part, the investment in these technologies, uh, these dispatchable technologies, has a, a little effect in, in the sense, but not really uh, a statistically different effect from zero. Um, the, in other words, the uh, confidence intervals for the most part for the two extremes of this, these uh, quantile effects are pretty much not different from zero, although you can see the point estimate, particularly for the small, uh, the, I think it's the small hydro, are, are upward sloping. But now, if we bring in the uh, wind and, and, and solar, you can see that what a megawatt of investment in, the, in those technologies do is significantly increase the extremes of the ramp distribution. So in other words, what it's showing is, is that a one megawatt uh, increase in the uh, solar or wind is, is, you know, in the extremes is increasing the hourly uh, uh, ramp rate by more, you know, more than 0.1, uh, if you like, uh, megawatt hours. So, you know, quite, quite a substantial increase in both the hourly ramp up as well as you can see hourly ramp down. And in fact, probably the hourly ramp downs increase more than the hourly ramp ups, which is in the, I guess I would say the surprising result, I think is the fact that the wind uh, is not much different in terms of that versus the solar. Whereas we know that the solar is sort of deterministically going to disappear at the end of the day and reappear at the beginning of the day. But we can see that the, you know, this intermittency that you get from wind, which is really just, you know, based upon the availability of wind, it, it is quite similar in terms of its at least per megawatt hour investment increase in the extremes of the ramp rate distribution. All right, so it's just the, 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 the you know, the, the, this is just basically showing that, you know, just an anecdotal illustration of, you know, what's, what's happening in terms of just the increase in the uh, ramp rates. So you can see that in 2005, when you had very little uh, uh, behind the, the uh, in the distribution network uh, wind generation, uh, you can see that the, the blue pattern was the net demand. When you installed this uh, 10 megawatts of uh, distributed wind, uh, you can see what you did uh, to the uh, hourly ramp rate over the same uh, 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 you know, time interval. So considerably increase in the volatility. So just to, to finish up, uh, as I said, the, 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 main, the main takeaways is really uh, the, is the fact that it, it certainly looks like from our perspective based on this work is, is that you know, actual data from over 2,000 substations, uh, over 14 years a worth of investments in distributed generation and quite significant increases in investment in distributed generation, um, that, that these investments in wind and PV had very little uh, sort of reduction in the peak withdrawals from the distribution grid uh, uh, and significantly increased the hourly ramps in the distribution grid, both in the plus and the minus directions, I think these results are certainly helped to explain what we saw uh, at the beginning of the talk right here, which is increases in the capital investment in the distribution network to effectively handle the fact that you've got to worry about these reverse flows, you've got to worry about the faster 
ramps that are coming, you need to upgrade the distribution network to accommodate those. So if anything, it's, it's, it's more of the in installation of wind and solar, at least if we take the example that we got from uh, France, is if anything, probably increasing the cost rather than uh, helping uh, uh, to avoid those costs. Whereas in the case of the thermal resources, the small hydro, um, the both renewable and non-renewable thermal resources, we, we saw that those did uh, significantly reduce uh, peak utilization uh, of the distribution grid. So the, the one thing that we're investigating now is this idea of, okay, um, one of the things that might help is the fact that if you have a uh, distributed battery storage in the distribution grid, uh, could that help you um, essentially get some of these peak reduction benefits and how much battery storage uh, would it take? One of the other, just to, just to give a little bit of information on, on that, we've, we've done uh, some sorts of uh, various uh, you know, models of how a battery might behave and one of the things that was, again, surprising to us based on this data is the substantial amount of battery investment in the distribution grid that is necessary um, to uh, effectively uh, get a reduction at the top of that uh, uh, net load distribution from a megawatt of investment in distributed solar or distributed wind. So, um, you know, basically saying, uh, that a lot of battery uh, investment is necessary as you significantly, you know, scale up the amount of wind and solar to the levels that we are at least seeing at the end of our sample period in in many of these distribution grids. So um, I'll I'll uh, I'll stop here and take any questions. Oh, thank you very much, Frank. That was. Uh, that's terrific. So um, we have a, a few few questions lined up. Um, there's a couple around this theme um, of, um, you know, one, one, one question for David Javier is, is, do we care about the ramp rate in the distribution network or do we care about ramp effects on the bulk power system? And there was another question along the similar lines of, of to sort of say is the inference that DER is driving the need for network augmentation to accommodate ramp rates and energy flow needs, um, but are there other influences? Well, I think I think this is more a question of your analysis. Are, are other influences on demand isolated and removed, which I believe is probably the fixed effects in your model? But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can speak to we, that. We, we, we we're basically giving, if you like, a um, and we 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 the other thing we've done is is tried to sort of model. Uh, with greater uh, granularity in terms of allowing, say, for different uh, uh, rates of growth in demand across different distribution uh, networks. And again, the, the results are fairly, are at least the, the, the results that I'm talking about are, are quite similar um, in the sense of you, you, if anything goes the other way of making it even less likely uh, that in other words, the wind results become to look more like the solar results uh, in the sense of almost nothing at the upper end. So um, yeah, so I mean, the, 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 the point that I'd make is that uh, on the ramp rates is, is that certainly one of the things that, that you know, in order to accommodate these bi-directional flows, there are things that, uh, that, that, that folks are doing, or at least utilities are doing, uh, in terms of their distribution uh, network investments to, uh, to, to essentially ensure reliable operation of the grid, uh, given both the fact that you can have reverse flows as well, as well as they can reverse very quickly. So, I mean, it, it, that is certainly, I think, a, 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 a driver of, uh, of a lot of this investment. I know that, you know, for example, in California, uh, just to, to give an example, uh, you know, the, the, if you like, since uh, roughly between, say, uh, you know, roughly 2008 and uh, the present, uh, the, the, if you like, cost of the distribution network in California ha has more than doubled. And, you know, in large part, that, that is, I mean, we, we in California uh, have more than um, almost 9,000 megawatts of distributed uh, solar installed uh, throughout the state. So, uh, and it's unfortunately very concentrated 
uh, in regions with, uh, 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 you know, where people with big houses and want to put up solar live. Great, thanks, Frank. Um, let me see. There's an early question which uh, was, was was along the lines of, I'm not sure your analysis can speak to that, but I'm sure you can speak to it to say. Uh, why should I believe that regulated DNSPs have properly responded to the development of DER? You know, and, um... Oh, uh, I completely agree. I mean, it, it, I, I would not say that, you know, this is a classic case of past performance is no indication of future outcomes. I mean, but what it's simply saying is, is that historically, uh, there's very little evidence that, you um, these investments have saved anything in terms of uh, distribution network investments. And I would certainly, you know, and so the, the idea is to say, let's get busy and think about how we want to plan uh, distribution networks to more efficiently, you know, hopefully uh, take advantage and, you know, deploy storage, do other kinds of things. So, you know, I would certainly, I would certainly expect this is not a paper that's forecasting the future. This is just simply a paper that's saying, if you continue to do what you have been doing, it's probably not going to work out the way you'd hoped, um, because historically, it, it doesn't. At least in the case of France, it it hasn't. Terrific. Um, since you've mentioned storage a couple of times, someone's obviously just. <laughs> Ask the question, or maybe you can just elaborate more. Uh, yeah, could the injection of batteries in the future change this picture? And maybe you could talk about um, anything you think may be relevant when when thinking about uh, batteries in the distribution network versus uh, you know large scale outside of it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I I guess you know it. it I, I think, and, and it, I mean, to me, an interesting question is, uh, you know why is a lot of this investment taking place? And, you know, again, in the case of, uh, in, unfortunately, I think a lot of the investment is taking place in the distribution grid, certainly in California, is not because it's the cheapest source of zero carbon electricity, uh, far from it. Um, it. It is taking place because I would like to push costs uh, that are sunk that I have been recovering in my that have been recovered from my rates uh, onto others uh, by installing a distributed solar system. I mean to 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 and so you know I think that's another uh, you know issue that that needs to be considered is thinking about how do we think about pricing access to the distribution network in such a way that we aren't giving people this incentive. To do something it maybe is privately beneficial to them, but perhaps raises the cost to everyone else who is unable to, i.e., own a house or put a solar panels on their roof. I mean, to uh, go to the case of California, um, you know, uh, average residential prices are uh, 22 cents uh, per kilowatt hour. The average price of wholesale electricity in California is currently about four cents per kilowatt hour. So, you know, if you figure, okay, the marginal cost of delivering that energy to me is probably at most one cent, that would be off the charts, the high levels of marginal losses and the like, um, you know, basically uh, the, the difference between five cents and, and essentially 22 cents, that is all to recover things like the sunk costs of the transmission network, the distribution network, and um, as well as the many, many uh, uh, subsidies that we have in California for things like energy efficiency and um, investments in uh, subsidies for storage, subsidies for distributed generation. So, you know, it, it, is, it, is, it is giving a, a lot of incentives for people that can to say, gee, by installing the solar system, I get to push those costs onto somebody else. Terrific, and I think that answers another question we had, which was how would you expect tariff design to impact upon uh, distributed resource behavior, which I, I think you've just, you've answered that. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, there's a few more, which um, we might uh, address now. So um, Steve Wetton is asking, 
what is the seasonal diurnal pattern of demand in France? Um, you know, could the lack of impact of solar PV on peaks be driven by a demand pattern where those peaks are occurring, say in winter um, or, or, or so on and so forth? Um, and you know, would you potentially expect different con policy conclusions in Australia or California? Yeah, that's a good. That's a good. That's that's uh, that's certainly true. Uh, uh, France is a winter peaking system, um, uh, so that 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 certainly I think uh, it helps to explain the solar. But um, uh, I guess the point that I would make about California is. Um, we sort of, um, uh, you know, I mean, it, 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 the peak in California now is unfortunately when it's dark. So the fact that we have, you know, close to, uh, you know, uh, probably 13, 14,000 megawatts of grid scale solar and an additional probably 9,000 of distributed solar, uh, the peaks are occurring right as it's, you know, getting dark. And, you know, so the, at least I would say in the case of California, uh, you know, it'd be, I'd love to have that data. Unfortunately, uh, it, it, none of the utilities are really wild about uh, letting that data get out, but, you know, it, 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 at least thinking from that perspective, it certainly looks like, um, you know, you would you would likely get a similar uh, sort of result. Right. Um, there's a couple more questions here. We have time, so I'll get to them. Um, a question from Jack Speed. In your follow-up work on the effect of capacitance on the reduction of this ramp duration curve. Do you analyze the difference between installed capacity at the generator, I'm thinking assuming generator level, so firming and big battery investment versus installed capacitance at the user? So community batteries, for example. Yeah, I mean, we uh, all, we're do, all we're doing is, uh, yeah, I mean, all we can do is just say, let's put a battery somewhere in the distribution uh, uh, grid uh, below the substation that is going to, and then, we use, we have like one model that's a perfect foresight model. So it knows exactly when the right time to charge and the right time to discharge is based upon the net demands for the day. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, other where we take less, uh, if you like, uh, uh, perfect foresight kinds of uh, uh, assumptions, rules of thumbs and other cases, uh, a, you know, simple sort of a dynamic programming model based upon the hourly uh, prices of electricity, and you know, it, 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 as I said, the one thing that is 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 what sort of comes out of that is that when you have a a, a significant amount of distributed uh, wind and solar, you need a lot of batteries to uh, effectively really uh, have an impact on uh, the 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 net withdrawals, at least based on the the you know the 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 data that we have. In other words, what we're doing is essentially saying, okay, let's just, let's take the historical data that you have, let's put in a battery into the system, let's let some sort of um, you know model of how that battery would be used. Let's see how much battery we need in order to obtain uh, uh, you know a, a you know a peak reduction. Uh, it 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 is it is unfortunately fairly substantial. Great. Um, I'm going to paraphrase one of these questions, uh, Frank. I, I'm assuming you could do an analogous exercise where you look at the marginal impact of add, adding, say, uh, an industrial facility or a household or, 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 or whatever on, on this, uh, uh, you know, well, basically on the quantiles of the distribution, if you had that such data. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you could, you could put in a... Um, I mean, all you need is the, if you like, is the load shape of the um, of the uh, of the household. I mean, that that that's that's all you yep. would need. Yep. And, and and just the second part of this question. So another query would be if your recommendation is to promote larger uh, capacity stations, or I'm guessing substations is what they're, they're saying. 
No, no, I mean, my only point is, is that is, <laughs> is the, the point that I, I, I'm trying to first dispel the sort of claim that, that, that at least in this case, that the investments in these technologies reduced the need for investments in the distribution grid, that certainly seems not to be borne out by the analysis. What the appropriate you know, re response is, I guess my argument would be is, if investing in distributed solar and, 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 and wind is the least cost way to achieve climate goals that you have, uh, and you include the cost of the distribution network upgrades that perhaps are necess necessitated by that, that's the right answer. I, I just question that, the, as I said in response to the, 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 one of the questions that Gordon asked, is I question whether or not that is the least cost response to reducing the uh, carbon content of your electricity consumed, given at least what we see in the United States in that uh, grid scale solar is probably uh, at least a third to a half cheaper on a levelized cost basis versus uh, distributed solar. And you know, uh, probably not as large for distributed wind versus distribu uh, uh, grid scale wind, but still uh, it is a, 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 a cheaper source of kilowatt hours. And so what that would mean is that if we didn't, you know, got rid of this, uh, you know, priced, if you like, the distribution network on a marginal cost basis, it's unlikely that there would be much investment, at least based on economics, maybe people wishing to make a, uh, you know, an environmental statement by the solar panels on their roof or something like that. But, the, you know, economics would likely not be driving it, but for at least what we see in California, the fact that it does uh, allow you to, 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 to escape a lot of the payment for the sunk costs of the distribution and transmission networks. Terrific, thanks Frank. I think we'll probably leave it there. We've got a couple of other uh, questions, one, one of which we may ask uh, after the answer after the fact, um, but a uh, few thank yous. One comment, of course, the SOAN substation data is available in Australia, which uh, for, for attendees of this seminar last week I, I was using. So I would also like to say Frank, th say thank you, Frank, because I think some honours masters or PhD students have a Australian replication study in their future of your work. This has been uh, uh, very interesting and I'll, I'm not sure, we'll see what we can do with, with, with what we've got here. But uh, um, this, this was, uh, quite incredibly uh, insightful. So uh, thank you once again to, to, to Professor Frank Wallach and thank you to our attendees and those that have asked questions. Uh, I believe a recording uh, has, has occurred and this will be uh, made publicly available. And um, I'd just like uh, to encourage uh, the attendees to keep an eye on, on, on the work we're doing here uh, at Monash and the speakers we're getting in um, and, and um, yeah, we'll we'll surely have a few more of these in the uh, in the near future. So thank you once again, Frank. Oh, thank you. Thanks everyone for your questions. Very uh, very helpful. Um, thank you.